Um, it's, it's, a, it's a special pleasure to introduce David Gawanter. David uh, got his PhD at Berkeley. He, every decade in my experience uh, teaching in a place is defined by the brilliant graduate students and undergraduates uh, in each generation. And for 10 years, or almost, uh, David was uh, helped run the poetry series, edit the journals, was uh, just terrific company. He, he got a job teaching at Georgetown University. He's published three books of poems, um, In the Belly, uh, The Sleep of Reason, um, and uh, Warbird, most recently. And a new book of poems coming out appropriately during this time on uh, that's rooted in the history of industrial violence in the U.S. or in the world at large. He, uh, Warbird, his most recent book, uh, comes from someone who was trying to make sense of the world while living in Washington, D.C., as a person who teaches at Georgetown does. So um, David's poems... Uh, he has he has like T. S. Eliot or a satirist gift, but he he has a much more complicated vision than that. As I was rereading Warbird last night and remembering that every time I thought I knew where it was going, it went someplace else. He's a, he's a surprising, morally complicated writer who could easily have just been a terrifically funny satirist and comedian, but he doesn't. He goes there, but he doesn't. Stay there. Uh, Warbird takes its title from uh, uh, a demonstration by American poets. You will remember the time when uh, they had the idea of inviting a bunch of poets to the White House just after George Bush invaded Iraq, and American poets responded by writing a thousand anti war poems, and there was a demonstration. So David writes a poem because he was in Washington out of that experience that begins with an image of the White House not being able to take off even though it has wings, and moves on to the hawks around the around the city and the hawks in the park and to a kind of history of the archaeology of the place, Jefferson digging up old bones, that reaching further and further, he's trying to make sense of the, of the world in a, in a very powerful way. See, John Shoptaw's poems do a similar thing. It's, it's a really uh, exciting to read and uh, I'm very happy that he's here today. Please welcome David Gawander. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been wandering around campus this morning looking for my youth <laughs> or its shadow. If you find it, um, I'll give you my email address. <laughs> Send it as an attached file of, of remorse. Um, just an insider uh, element from DC, the um, thousand poet poems that were sent in against the war were actually all poems written about the poet's mother. But they took out mother and they put in Bush. And, and then they got it uh, published on the internet. So um, I'm going to read a, a bunch of things from different books, I guess. And I have a, a new book manuscript. Uh, called uh, Fort Necessity, which is a lot about industrial violence and um, convict leasing in um, 19th century, 20th century America. Uh, OK. So um, here's a, a little poem, since um, we're all t many of us are teachers here. This is called um, The Unspeakable. I had a student named uh, Charlie Bernstein, and he has the same name as an uh, experimental poet, Charles Bernstein. So this is what happened. The Unspeakable. My student, Charlie Bernstein, strapping curly hair, about to take a step, like Rilke's blind man, pondering, fingers at his lips. He wrote poems about flowers, hillsides, the girls he would bring there, and I nudged him. Send your stuff to the poet Charles Bernstein. He says language writes his poems. He says, quote, that these dimensions are the material of which the writing. This guy should meet another Charles Bernstein. 
Tell him you wrote his books. <laughs> Curse my tongue. The boy never mailed them, but after he left school, he was driving all night through Texas, and a truck killed him. I met Professor Bernstein once, stooped, alive, and told him about Charlie. He said, and I answered, two dray horses champing at seeds and forage. Uh, a Berkeley poem from uh, another century. Uh, someone, uh, a friend of mine said, this is like poems got a trick ending. I thought they're all supposed to have trick endings. But, uh, this one um, asks a question at the end and the um, title is the answer to that question. The title is, don't go down on any bunny. Ski masked, axe wielding anti vivisectionists chop down lab doors, freeing a hundred gray rabbits caged for research and infected with herpes. How do you keep safe from herpid rabbits? Safety tip. Um, here's one that uh, some of it takes place in uh, Michigan and some of it takes place in um, uh, a gift shop that my mother ran at uh, the University of Michigan. And um, my mother was really big on having politicians assassinated. And um, at a certain point, Robert Pinsky's daughter started working for my mother, and I realized that it was only a matter of time before either Pinsky wrote this poem or I did. <laughs> Leopard Man. Mom once posed as LaGuardia's girlfriend and smoothed her way past an usher. She gets gas attacks at lectures and even gave herself a cardiac, worrying which cruise to take. A lifelong scrimmage between ambition and self-doubt has given her a fretful, pestering energy and a genius for quirky triumphs over cabbie, onion, and varicose vein. Working in a museum gift shop, she hears that Reagan has been shot and says, Hinkley botched the job. <laughs> was it that, or was it her rebuking letters, each one signed, an ex-Republican, so it hurt more? <laughs> Something put her on a list, because a secret serviceman comes to question her. No sunglasses now. He's undercover and checking his notes. Young Spartacus, gray panther, quote, I'd wear a dynamite girdle and blow us both up. They never check me, I'm a grandma. <laughs> the bronze breast of an Ethiopian goddess almost touch his back. He doesn't see them, but I do. Generations of schoolboys have rubbed her cool nipples all shiny, big golden pawns. And I love to see my mother behind the counter, tidying up the fossil fish and reptile rulers, watching him walk up and whispering a sales blessing on the lot, a wizard of retail. He fingers some shark's teeth, chatting headlines, politics. Yeah, and what about his cutback on aid to dependent children? He's a stinking, lousy miser, that's what. This talking drum, see it, and the husk face, both on sale. Back and forth they go, he schooled in interview maneuvers, she assuming a man so full of grudges would want a bargain. So tell me, what should we do about a man like that? We've all heard mom blurt out assassination in answer to this. Now she muses, do? Well, I don't know. I guess we could vote him out of office? <laughs> Which sends him packing. While mom sits and rests her ankles, safe within her Old Testament justice and shopkeeper's courtesy. In case nearby, the leopard man has seen all this. The leopard man, exorcist of his tribe while he wears the skin, who could suffer a vision and kill his whole family, and yet be spared because in dreams he sees the enemy clearly. He stoops behind the glass, a fusty mannequin. One eye points at mom, but the other is painted too far to the side. His sight widens, and the world could fall within his gaze. I think I was going to read something else. Oh, yeah. Um,
My first teacher was Tom Gunn. Uh, sometime after he died, I had this dream at, in the middle of the night. So it's three at 4.43. It's three dreams. Light torn by trees. A cafe, a girl, and a gray man. A windstorm must have struck him. Her eyes follow his frayed collars and hair. Then another girl is talking. My friend saw my chili tattoo and called it a carrot. So I had it removed. Now, a ghost chili carrot. And here comes my friend, limping on his heavy boot, the heel come off. A cobbler's shop appears, and I buy the black nails, the dwarf's hammer, glue and strapping. I work hard on it, bending there until he speaks and walks on. But as he is dead, his voice and step make no sound. Um, this is a backward alphabet poem, 26 words from uh, Z to A. Zero account, 25 to go. Zero account, your ex withdrawn, vengeful, undertakes the spousal ripoff. Quivering passion once negated murders love. Kindness, justice is how greed frames every divorce. Cupid's backstabbing alphabet. Um, this is called a one-page novel. I was very pleased. I wrote it in one page. They uh, published it, and it was on two pages. Uh, my uh, badly pronounced French at the end of this uh, poem is uh, translated afterwards. One-page novel. Kind, almost courtly, a good listener, he kept lovers away, fearing and feeling that long contact would reveal some horrid prospect of his interior. And though his soul had stilled like seawater left in a tank, he kept his dread as a keepsake, caring more for it than for the woman who pressed herself against his arm at work, breathing. So that when he met a dark-eyed misanthrope whose severe answers to men masked her own fear of exposure, of letting her nature mix with theirs, he thought she discovered his hidden self like a gleaner in a field of glass gems, who, knowing the small profit in some glittering cast-off, still pockets it for another day. What a free zone, he told himself, to be seen at last, seen through, to be found wanting and still wanted. He took her sourness for sympathy, criticism for care, and she, sensing that withheld affection somehow contented him knew he'd never press her to the wall. Whether a man thinks too much of himself or too little, the woman is left alone. How well their love was paid for what it gave away, a damp valley now blacken blackening beyond the smudge lamps of their terrace. Flanked on the love seat, they hug a family of stratagems while the lost coin of the sun rolls over the stronghold of houses, over the reckless sea, then gilds other houses, then rolls away. Je reste roi de mes douleurs. I remain king of my sorrows. Um, some new, newer poems. Uh, this one's on uh, girl gymnasts, and it uh, refers to Carrie Strug, who was the uh, gymnast in the uh, 1996 Olympics who did the mumbo jumbo over the horse and screwed up her ankle, called Stick the Landing. Because they are tiny and gaunt and strong, willow spine and sturdy cable legs, because they are willful and drive themselves like sled dogs, the girls grow in the gym on spongy mats and liniment air, stalking the bars and beams and horses. High above, a boy hangs from the rings, a pocket Hercules, arms rigidly out, face of stone, a kind of machine-still crucifix. Yet the muscles tremble slightly, human and imperfect, the judges note, his body on trial. The girls are pixies, though their hands blister, 
and live inside a Peter Pan curse, our never grow up darlings waving brightly in track suits, fresh, unstained, no blood on the leg to announce the woman in the body that clutched the last month of girlhood for years. In the stands loom their sisters, a haunt-eyed race of elves waiting their turn, picking at calluses, little Sandy, Chantel, Becca, eager snapping birds. And the massive, soft-bellied parents who slosh and jig at their bony, capering daughters below, their rocket jumps arched back in peekaboo, now puppet, now python, now scissors or yo-yo, all the while the minute failings of a hand or knee drop the score from the crevice of 10. The judges tap, tap, because they had once leapt, because they coach, because girlhoods linger in their eyes. They sit there girdled, the weird sisters. Yet their masks did crackle once and betray a feeling, just once, in Atlanta, when Carrie, the littlest of Americans, hurtled toward the horse, ricocheted upward, twisting and falling, yet her body botched the landing, tore the ankle ligaments, toppling her back. Mark and Stain were tallied, hopping to the arms of her bear-like coach, who whispered in foreign accent, one more vault, one high score, and we win. So she ran and jumped, desperate soldier, aching and spinning, and the feet stuck. But once she turned to face the judges, she lifted the torn leg like a fawn. Then it was that the judges gaped and jerked their hands to their open mouths and saw the ruin and triumph of it all. After the numbers, after the ribbons and the medals, it was their hands that said, judge this child, judge this childhood that broke before you. I uh, wrote some sonnets, I'm calling them the ego anthology. Um, I'll try out a couple on you. These are new things. Uh, service ego, this is uh, running into your psychiatrist years later. Service ego, she sees him shuffle crabwise down the meat aisle. Is he that old, am I? Years after the years of analysis. He grips a paper bag of papers, confused, slowly collapsing inside the black office suit he wore when torrents of intimacies had poured down his gullet, the years of, when he hurts me, I apologize. Load on him the causes, O oh muse. The sausages dangle above him. She takes his arm. Doctor, remember me? Are you all right? Once he had told her, you're no fireman and he's no burning house. Now he looks up, the lockbox, the old child playing doctor. Oh, hello, you can't help me. Uh, I was a visitor at a university in Poland um, in the town which my father had always told me was called Ludz, but everyone else seems to be calling Wudz, L-O-D-Z. And he toured me around and told me stuff and so this sort of misquotes him in, in the sonnet. This is called um, Last Stop Ego. So this all a quote. The Berlin Wall came down, the markets opened, all this killed, killed off downtown Wudge. Now our clothes come from China. Yet after the mills close, look, the snow turned white. We never knew. Old poles stand in the doorways staring past you, sell, selling flowers or forks. Everyone you meet is drunk. Some guy throws a cat or a baby out the window. Should we be shocked? Woodge has two plans to save itself. Build an airport near the highway or get tourists to visit the old train station. We were the last stop before the camps. Everyone goes to Auschwitz. Their hotels are full, not ours. We're building a memorial and we've got the cattle cars. Which I jumped into. They were open, there, there they were. Open and empty. Um, I'll try another one. This is a, a poem on a sexual jealousy, but uh, um, 
we lived in Boston, we had this uh, painter who, when he wasn't painting our walls, um, would go around collecting old toys off the curbs that people had left out and drove up to New Hampshire to his uh, parents' barn. And then they would put them on the shelves and all the people from Boston would go back up and buy them again. <laughs> However, the poem is about sexual jealousy. Jumble ego. It kind of slithers sideways. Jum jumble ego. Like a sagging barn, let's say. A barn sagging with old toys gathered from city streets. Like a hidden door handle, a handlebar mustache, your stash of love letters, the love bite you gave to your arm. Like an armoire bursting with party clothes, a clothes horse you ride naked, ride until you come. A come as you are a party of one, a party of 100 cloudy mirrors that city folk find in the country barn. All the trinkets looking vaguely familiar, like that special poem tucked in the drawer, the one sent by your old love. Remember, you had said, this one speaks to me. I recognize, I, I love uh, being in a, a series called Lunch Poems, famous Frank O'Hara title, but I'm mindful that it is putting the words lunch and poems in competition. <laughs> One of them is going to lose. Uh, so I think we're doing okay for time, but I, I'm, I'm mindful of that. The noise I'm hearing is no, stomachs. Uh, this is uh, another uh, sort of newish poem, uh, Smirch of the Postmodern. It's also having to do with uh, Polish. Smirch of the Postmodern. The Polish poet was reading to us, and when he said smirch, the Polish part of the audience laughed. Suddenly, we were laughing too, in Polish. Later, a guy said he was a great listener because he made comforting sounds when Italians told him their troubles. I didn't understand them. But I would shrug and frown, say bah, and they would keep talking. Just say bah, it's Italian. It's subjunctive for that's awful. <laughs> then he told us the to listener bah in Mandarin, wah. But I was noticing his large ears, ornate seashell folds and trellises with a good meaty thumb's worth of lobe flesh dangling below. He was predetermined. The porn star, bright star, moans, oh, 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 in American videos, and I, I, I in Spanish. Stella, bilingual, trilingual, three thumbs up. Put her on mute. Then we heard the Polish poem in English. Smirch means death. In the cartoon post office, we're the envelopes dropping through different slots, air, local, or foreign, all landing in the same bin, a flutter of shrouds. My family crest reads, why was I not informed earlier? I guess I'll, I'll um, I wasn't gonna do it, but I think I'm gonna uh, read this uh, title poem to his book that Bob very nicely mentioned. Um, And it jumps around and it's looking at a lot of natural history and um, kind of putting that together with uh, war conflicts in Washington, I guess. Uh, this anecdote about um, Casablanca, it, it is true that they thought Casablanca meant uh, White House, which it does, erroneously. Um, yeah, well, anyways, just read it. Um, thank you in advance, this is my last poem. Warbird, a journal, Poets' Anti-War Rally, February 2003. The massed and pillared wings of the White House never fly. Whitewashed yearly, they stand impervious to metaphor, to hawk and dove and red armies of ants. Only the halting squ squirrels interrogate, creeping past the arrowhead gates to scratch the Midas lawns for treasure. On the street, Commentators wander like boys in a story too simple to explain. The political message, a hat punched inside out. Once the Nazis got word that Churchill would visit Roosevelt in Casablanca, U-boats bobbed near the Potomac, waiting for him. But Churchill, 
as he said, was sailing to Morocco. Reagan protesters splashed the Pentagon walls daily with cow blood. Soldiers waxed the plaster, and trireams of rats licked the bloody grass. The EPA sent health goons to stomp them and the pacifists away. Then rats stormed the National Zoo. Urbane, patient inheritors of the earth, they snapped prairie dogs like wishbones. Vigilante zookeepers laced the ground with poison, Carthadelenda est, and killed the hippo. Here in the New World Order, penguin and polar bear soak up ozone, and nation shall beat them both into plowshares. Hawks and fat cats disdained the White House squirrels. Their proconsul Chevy Suburban nosed us aside. We spoke against the war and for the cameras, spelled our names on Chinese radio. Elder poets shrewdly loitered at the lobbyist bar, read first, then left us to the phalange of secret servicemen, chatting like critics into their black lapels at every bungled line. This was no singing school. No falcon heard our crows and warbles. Emily, our modest leader, rapped the, at the gate. Mrs. Bush wanted American poems. I brought 3,000, all against the war. Can you take them? Gulping, the pimply guard asked his shirt for help. Older hands hustled up. The great Oz cannot see you, etc. <laughs> Will four and 20 blackbirds fill a cowboy hat? Bunkered below decks, the president goes for the burn, racing the cut tongue of his treadmill to a dead heat. Even Nixon met the enemy once, strode with his staff into a red sea of hippies. They didn't part, and he burbled about baseball. From his desk, he liked to watch the sightseers through a gap in the hedges. Peaceniks learned this and blocked his view, stood there day and night for years. Nixon, nightmare reality shanking through his eyes, knelt with Kissinger. Henry, he moaned, what do they want? Days from now, how many days, the Valentine woo at the zoo begins. A hand-raised falcon bows, and shares meat with its master. He bows in turn and eats. Both softly whisper, Ichu, Ichu, a duet heard only on abstract and crumbling cliffs. If a man were to stand or sing there, he'd fall. The master straps on a falcon feathered courtesan's hat and turns away. Flapping wildly, the falcon claws the head shape, squawking gyrating to hold on, imperial lunge and lunge, biting at the skull it fed as semen slowly drips into a rubber dam. Thanks very much. <laughs>